Today on Cult Pop, we're at the beautiful Yankee Air Museum, and I'm delighted to be speaking with Kevin Walsh, the executive director here. This is going to be an incredible show, so stay tuned. I'm at the Yankee Air Museum, and with me is Kevin Walsh. And Kevin, I'm really fired up to be here today. We've got a whole lot to talk about, so let's jump right in and kind of give me an overview of the Yankee Air Museum. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'm the executive director of the Yankee Air Museum, and the museum was founded in 1981. So we're celebrating our 35th anniversary in 2016, and, and we couldn't be more excited about the path the museum's uh, going on. The, the museum's comprised of an incredible amount of, of different things that people will experience when they come here. Uh, a lot of time they think of an air aviation museum as airplanes and placards, and uh, we are much, much more than that. Um, and as we continue to develop into uh, the museum we are now in the future museum, uh, we have a lot of big plans to become much more interactive and, uh, and of course, uh, much more of an inspiration to the youth of America. Well, something that's always been very interesting to me about this it's a very functioning museum that also property sits on an, there, there's an airport right here. So it's inter, there's also in the summer, you can come out and see airplanes going up and down and stuff. So that makes it really unique to, compared to anything else in the country. Talk a little bit about its connection with the airport. Sure, absolutely. Well, for us as a, a museum that flies airplanes, we have to be on an airfield. Um, and that's why the museum is positioned at Willow Run Airport. That's why it was founded at Willow Run Airport, because the intention was not just to restore these airplanes and have them static. These are airplanes that fly, we take them on display. But one of the bigger things uh, and one of the most unique things that you can do here at the museum is fly on them. Uh, so we have four airplanes that actually you can fly on two are World War II bombers, one of the most famous bombers of World War II, the B-17 Flying Fortress, the B-25 Mitchell bomber, the most famous medium-sized bomber of World War II, the C-47 Transport, the most famous transport of World War II, and then we have for the, the real adventurous daredevil type folks, uh, we have an open cockpit biplane ride oh, wow. in, in Waco biplanes that actually takes two passengers up front and the pilot's in the back, so you as the passenger sit up front right behind the engine, open cockpit, and, uh, and those are the four different ride experiences that we offer. So being on the airfield is mandatory for us because uh, we use these runways and taxiways to, for our visitors to the museum. Now, speaking with our director off camera, he told me that that's very, very popular in the summertime, that there's lines of people wanting to do that. I'm still a nervous flyer, even though I fly a great deal for work. I'm still a nervous flyer. But how do you, how do you deal with the people coming to make them comfortable, get them in a plane? Because these planes are from another era, so there might be a, a bygone era. Might be a guy 6'2 like me. There might be, are, are there any restrictions? And do you, how do you make the people comfortable to know that they're safe and it's a lot of fun? Well, they, they're incredibly safe. And, and uh, when we look at the maintenance of these airplanes and we look at the, uh, the care and uh, TLC that the airplanes are under, um, it, it, is, it is probably more than any, uh, any other aircraft that you're watching flying around. Um, the FAA governs everything that we do. Uh, the aircraft actually um, are in winter maintenance uh, about four months uh, where they take apart everything, they inspect everything, uh, so the airplanes are incredibly safe to fly on. Um, and the fact that we've been operating them for, uh, for years, um, we've become very proficient in the rides. Now, um, getting people encouraged to fly on them, that's, uh, that's pretty easy. Once you see these airplanes, um, even seeing them from the outside, you start to get excited about the visceral experience that you're gonna have on the inside of the airplanes and once you get up in the air. And a lot of folks, very nervous when they come, um, but once they see what they're about to fly in and really see this once in a lifetime experience that they can have again and again, um, they get very comfortable very quick. Um, and it's nothing like flying out of a commercial airliner um, at Detroit Metro Airport. This is um, an incredibly visceral experience. You have these big, huge radial engines. Um, the skin of the airplanes is as thick as a quarter, and that's it. Um, so you, you have the smoke, the sights, the sounds, everything about uh, flying back uh, in those eras. Um, and in particular, uh, with the, the biplane, you've got the wind blowing in your face, too, um, as, as you do it. But um, the, the very experience itself is so incredibly different that people aren't concerned about the normal fears they have when they go flying. So um, most people absolutely love it. Um, a lot of people, you know, they, they take their first ride too, um, you know, because a friend buys, uh, buys the ride as a gift or um, they have a, a loved one that may be served in the military, they have a connection to the airplane and they just get on it because they want to feel that connection. That's fantastic. This museum 
to me is very special because of its, its family feel. And that now talking about these live flights, you can bring the whole family and maybe the older brother or sister wants to take that flight or the yeah. father or something because they have that emotional connection you're talking about. Yeah. The rest of the family can come in here, come inside and take a look at these incredible displays. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of these fantastic displays. And if you could maybe tell me a little story about one or two of the planes you're a young, a young father yourself, you have a yeah. young child. Maybe tell me about s some of the planes that you notice the kids flock to or some of the attractions that are just really important to families and make this a special family attraction. Well, I think one of the, the most unique aspects of our museum is that you, when you come in, you don't see a lot of barriers and ropes. People will get underneath the airplanes. The kids can run underneath the airplanes. They can get up and touch the airplanes. Um, you know, they're airplanes up close. Um, and there's no other place to go to see that or, or, or experience that. Um, we also, for the aircraft that um, we own, um, we will open up the cockpits and let kids and family members, moms and dads even want to do it, they want to sit in the cockpit of a, of a real airplane. Um, because where else can you do something like that? And that really generates the family experience when you can, you can come and do more than just stand behind a rope and look at something you get to interact with it. And that, that's one of the things that uh, since 1981, this museum has been about, and that has been the, the very closeness of, of aircraft, aviation, aerospace, and, and the ability to really be involved with it. Now, some of the things I was really, really impressed with walking through here, I kind of got a uh, behind the scenes tour here, and I was real thankful for that. And it's not just the aircraft. You have all type of static displays and displays people can walk into. We'll talk more about family friendly activities Absolutely. that can be done here. But uh, clothing, uh, equipment such as guns, helicopters, planes, all type of stuff. Tell us some specific items that are, are inside. Well, some, there's, I mean, everything that we have artifact-wise is special to us. Um, but, but certainly some of the standout items um, are, are some of our World War I artifacts. When you look at these uh, uniforms, when you look at these artifacts, you're looking at 100-year-old plus history at this point in time. And it's hard, you kind of don't think about it, but World War I was, was 100 years ago now. Um, and it's fantastic to be able to see the preservation work, to see the display work, and, and actually still be able to view these types of historical pieces. And it's incredible how much things have changed and sometimes how much they haven't changed, um, how similar some of the, uh, the artifacts are. Um, you know, but we, we focus and try to put out artifacts that show the advancement. Um, again, we, we are focused on STEM. Uh, we feel that we are certainly the, uh, the center to inspire the youth of America. It's not just come here and learn about history. It's come here and be inspired and look at the opportunities that exist in STEM careers and in particular aerospace. Um, obviously, that's a, it's near and dear to our hearts. But, um, you know, the technological advancements that the, the United States made um, you know, in, in aerospace uh, through the years has just been unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable, and in, in particularly even post-war um, uh, through the 50s where we went from propeller-driven airliners to jet airliners in 10 years. Um, never was there a time of such advancement, but uh, and we make sure those artifacts that, that are out have some type of, uh, you know, some type of connection to the development um, in, the, in the science and the technology behind it. Um, but of course, we also love to honor our veterans. Um, without our veterans, we wouldn't enjoy the freedoms we enjoy today. There's, there's no uh, doubt about that. Um, but also, we, we, love to, uh, we love to make sure that people understand the sacrifices our veterans made, the ultimate sacrifices, the continuing sacrifices, and, uh, and make sure that we're paying tribute to the men and women of our armed forces. Kevin, something I really like is walking around. If, if I was walking around with a family or families are walking around, I might want to just look at the planes. The kids have plenty to do here. Mm -hmm. And we're actually shooting right now in an area especially designed for kids. And you were talking about the, the STEM and how kids are mm -hmm. learning the sciences, technologies, and everything they're going to need to succeed going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got a, a little display here and interactive things going on for young people. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, this area right over sure, here where, yeah, where they can yeah. fly and, and do some different things. Yeah. Talk about that. If well, you. we realized um, about a year and a half ago, we looked at the, obviously the trends and UAS, UAVs, uh, you know, AKA drones um, were just, just all over the news, but also all over technology. Um, and, and really what we were seeing is the 
uh, the wide use of these these type of things and, and of course it's tough to have um, a 12 uh, year old come in and we let them fly an airplane well we can let them fly a UAS or UAV um, and so we created the fly zone which is nothing more than a gigantic batting cage um, where they're actually standing inside this caged area um, and they have protective eyewear on but they can actually fly uh, a quadcopter uh, UAS and, uh, and learn about the characteristics of flight um, understand what the practical applications of, of these units are um, and then what were career fields uh, because everyone thinks of drones and UAS as UAVs as being military and the um, the other side of the house, on the civilian side of the house, it is incredible the applications that we have um, that, uh, that different companies are using them for agricultural uses where farmers are figuring out where um, you know, some of the crops need more moisture or watering than, than others and they're able to disperse the resources and protect the resources all at the same time and getting uh, the most benefit out of the, the crop that year. Things like that, it, it's, it's fun to let kids know all these different career paths, but it's fun to let them actually pilot something. And that's the part that um, they absolutely love. What I really like about it also is that to teach our kids, I have a lot of friends that teach and things like that. A lot of my friends say you need to capture them, you need to make them think that they're playing or not even realize they're learning. You need to figure <laughs> out a way to get, and that's what you've done here. Because the kids, I've noticed that you, you've made it like an obstacle course. Yes. So they're going to be flying, they're going to be learning how to do this, they're going to learn, they're playing like they would a video game, so yep. you've kind of made it like a video game for them. Yep. Then instead of just saying up and down, big deal, they got to go through kind of a, a difficult looking obstacle course. And then if the parents want to, they can talk about, and when they go on the tour, how that, not only what you were talking about, but how that flight relates to this flight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. That's very, very impressive. Uh, s staying with that thought a little bit about uh, running through here and seeing all the wonderful things on display, all this stuff doesn't happen by itself. This place must run on a small army of, <laughs> of both workers and volunteers. Talk a little bit it, about that. It does. It, does. it runs on a very small paid staff, but it is the volunteers that are heart and soul of the museum. It has been since 1981. Um, we just had our volunteer appreciation uh, uh, dinner and banquet um, last night, actually, um, and uh, recognizing the number of hours that folks put in. Um, there was over 51,000 volunteer hours in 2015. Wow. Uh, that, that is just recorded volunteer hours. Many of the volunteers come and, and uh, they give their time, but we, we encourage them to make sure that they're giving us their uh, um, their time so that we can record that for, for grants and other purposes, but, um, but 51,000 hours in just volunteer times in 2015, I mean, that's how it gets done. Um, there is hundreds of regular volunteers throughout the, throughout the year um, working in a multitude of departments because when you think about it, you think about, well, obviously there must be a restoration department and there must be a flyable maintenance department and there must be some pilots that fly the airplanes. Um, the conservation, preservation, um, the department alone has, has many volunteers. Um, cataloging these artifacts takes many volunteers. Um, running uh, facility rentals takes many volunteers. Our educational programming in the education department all runs on volunteers except one education director. Um, so there's so many facets of the museum and there's hundreds of volunteers and you're right, it, it is a small army um, that keeps it running and, and I'll tell you it, their passion and dedication is unlike I've ever seen. Fantastic, now there's two things I think about while you're telling me about that. One, I wanna give you an opportunity to encourage people and let them know how they could volunteer and help out in the future. But I bet a lot of people watching this may have had a father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, uncle, cousin, something involved some way in the military, involved some way in the history, and they have stuff and, and they don't know what to do with it. Right. Is this a place that someone could reach out to and say, I have old bomber jackets, shoes, helmets, guns, whatever it may be. Is, it, is this a place, and could you tell me some stories of maybe if that's happened? Absolutely. Uh, we are the repository for, um, for artifacts um, for all eras. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, not just military either. Um, the, you know, we are uh, we are expanding our collection. We are including um, civilian aviation, commercial aviation, um, and, and of course military. Um, 
there's a process in which uh, folks can donate, and yankeeairmuseum.org is where you can find out all the information um, for that, or call the museum at 734-483-4030 um, and ask for the curatorial director, or uh, anyone on the front desk will be able to help you with that. Um, but yeah, we encourage the donations. Um, there are some spectacular donations that have come through. A gentleman just recently um, brought in um, uh, all, of his, uh, all of his gear from Vietnam. I said, would you guys be interested in stuff that's a little bit older? So we said, well, what do you have? And he said, well, I have my grandfather's stuff from World War II. And we said, well, we'd be very interested in that. And he said, well, then I also have my great-grandfather's stuff from World War I. Wow. And so to have three generations of uh, uh, military servicemen there, uh, and, and again, a, a local family, um, what a fantastic story. What a fantastic exhibit it will make in the future um, to have something like that. So we're, we're always encouraging people um, to contact the museum. And, uh, and if it fits into something that we're, we're scoping in our collection, we would love to have it. Okay, now uh, people have been seeing images throughout our interview, but could you maybe, keeping on with that story, it, it gets me thinking now, could you maybe give me an example of maybe one of the oldest artifacts you have here? Maybe most, one of the more modern things you've, you've been donated or have here, and something real uh, neat to you in between, something that really s strikes your fancy in between, <laughs> if you Well, I have, to, I have to, when you say what strikes my fancy, I, um, one of our World War II pilot unit, or sorry, World War I pilot uniforms that exists here um, and is on display in the museum uh, is, is kind, of, kind of special to me because it crosses over the boundary from um, aviation and museums to hockey. Um, the uh, the, the uh, individual um, who wore this uniform served in the same squadron as Hobie Baker. And if anybody knows anything about hockey, the college hockey award. That is, that is the college hockey award, the Hobie Baker. So the, uh, the very fact that this uniform, um, you know, and, and in the picture, Hobie Baker is in one of the pictures um, of the individual oh, wearing wow. this uniform. Uh, Uniform. So, and of course, um, for those that don't know, Hobie Baker was a World War One fighter pilot. After World War One was killed uh, in a in a training accident, um, and, and at that point in time, Hobie Baker was like the Wayne Gretzky of hockey. He was, it, he was a hockey phenom, and they thought hockey would end when Hobie Baker died. Um, that's how important Hobie Baker was to, to hockey 100 years ago, um, and that's why there there still exists an award in, in his name. Um, so. For me, it's one of the special items to, to see you know, this uniform and think that this, uh, this individual served in the same squadron along with Hobie Baker because uh, I'm a hockey nut at heart. That, no, that's a good story. <laughs> now, that's really cool. Now, how about something uh, a little more modern that, that really strikes your fancy? Yep. Well, it, and actually, it's coming in. Um, uh, the, uh, as most folks know, the, the Yankee Air Museum is the, uh, the, really the sponsor behind the Thunder Over Michigan Air Show that's been running for 18 years here at Willow Run Airport. Um, the 2015 um, Commander Tom Frosch, actually Captain Tom Frosch, um, uh, he was a uh, uh, Blue Angel lead, uh, but he also was a Michigan-born uh, and raised uh, um, uh, pilot. So uh, I actually reached out to him uh, a couple of days ago and said, sir, would you be willing to donate? Um, now that he's just re retired off the team and moved on his Navy career, so would you be willing to donate one of your uh, Blue Angel uniforms uh, oh. to the museum? And he said he'd be honored to because he's being from Michigan, he would love to see one of his uniforms on display back here in Michigan. And uh, so it's actually in the mail. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> Coming that's to us. fantastic. Um, so, but uh, to have uh, a leader of the Blue Angels, um, uh, somebody of, of that caliber, um, and, and a Michigan-born uh, 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 native at that best. It, it, it's That's going to be an incredible piece. Yeah, incredible piece. And, and the fact that he's honored to have it on display, and we're honored to have it. Um, and uh, I, I said, I said, if you could send us the one that you flew in when you uh, flew the air show for us. So. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, while we're talking about that a little bit, people are going to see this early enough to make plans for the air show this year. And this place is so special, and you've kind of talked about every year there's new stuff coming in, so every year people should be visiting. Exactly. If, and there should be a whole lot of first-timers that are going to see this, and this is going to strike their fancy. So let's talk about the air show, what it costs, and the ins and outs of coming, and, and kind of because there's a lot of things you should know about. You should get here early. You should be prepared for traffic. It's a busy weekend. T talk a little bit about sure, that. Sure, ab absolutely. Well, 2016, we've got something a little bit, a little bit uh, out of the norm. We're, we're going to try something 
that no other air show has done in the United States uh, that we, we're aware of. We're going to actually host two air shows. Um, on June 22nd, uh, we have an event called Wild Wednesday at Will Run, and uh, it will be an evening air show uh, featuring the Canadian Forces Snowbirds, uh, CF-18 Hornet demonstration, and the Canadian Forces uh, Skyhawks parachute team. This will all be a culmination of uh, all-day activities here at the museum, um, and then the culmination being the air show in the evening uh, at 7 o'clock at night. Um, then our big show, our two-day weekend, our, our two-day weekend show, will be August 2021, and it will feature the French-based Bretling Jet Team um, in their fourth last performance here in North America before they go back to Europe, and they probably won't be back again for decades. Oh wow! Um, so it's a, a rare opportunity. Both the Snowbirds and the Bretling Jet Team. It's their only summer Midwest appearance anywhere in the, in the Midwest. So we were really excited, really honored. They chose Ypsilanti uh, and Willow Run Airport and the Yankee Air Museum to come and, and fly these shows. Um, it, along with that, there's going to be many announcements. Some things I, I, I preliminarily know, but I can't talk about right now. Um, there's going to be some spectacular appearances uh, by aircraft we've never seen in the show before. Um, aircraft that people have been begging us to have. Um, but we did just confirm that we'll have the only air show appearance by the MiG-23 Flogger. This airplane does not go to air shows. It's a contract uh, airplane that does U.S. military work. Um, and it, right now it's the only flying two-seater uh, in North America. Um, and it actually is, is coming to perform uh, just that weekend, that weekend only. No other air show in the United States will have it. Um, and uh, if you've never seen anything like these further advanced MiGs, uh, the, the smaller MiGs of MiG-15, MiG-17 that were in Vietnam, very impressive aircraft. What happened in the Cold War uh, behind the Iron Curtain, people get to see what type wow. of technological advancement and why we were building the F-15 and the F-14 and the F-16, all those fighters, uh, because we had, we had notions of what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. So. Oh, this will be wonderful. Uh, as we're getting close to wrapping up, we still have a little time. I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about, you, you've already told us a little bit about 16, but plans for 2016 and beyond this museum. You've got some great plans. It's a great, great museum. People should be coming, but there's plans for people to be interested in this place for years to come, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, and, and that's probably the most exciting topic right now for us. Um, as, uh, as some of the viewers may know, um, and, and some may not know, in 2004, um, the entire museum was lost to fire. Um, uh, so, so 81 to 2004, we were in a, a World War II hangar here at Willow Run. Uh, fire swept through the building on a Saturday night, the first October uh, Saturday. Um, and uh, we were able to pull the flyable airplanes out, a couple of toolboxes, and we lost 35,000 artifacts and eight airplanes. Uh, from 2004 to 2010, we didn't have a home. Um, we actually were a museum that kind of e existed in an enigma. Um, and in 2010, we had fundraised enough money to, to buy this building we're in now. Um, and we bought this building, uh, open to the public, made it a destination point. Uh, but we knew it was a stepping stone. We had no idea what was next, but we knew we had to, to get back to a destination point. So we got to, uh, to open this building in 2010, and then lo and behold, in 2013, um, the Willow Run Bomber plant was being torn down. Um, we found out about it in 2012. Uh, we made our, our inroads to save part of it. Uh, we were successful in 2013 uh, in, in uh, acquiring um, and owning 144,000 square feet of that plant before it was torn down. It is now uh, the Yankee Air Museums, the property, the building, and it is now under renovation because when it is done in the next few years, it will be a 144,000 square foot museum um, and it will be the new home for the Yankee Air Museum, but we'll take on a new name. Uh, at that point, we will move to a national level and we will become the National Museum of Aviation and Technology uh, because what we'll be doing there um, is, is even far beyond the, what we're doing now. Um, and we're, we're super excited about it. There's been a lot of, lot of work done on the building already. Um, we still need a lot of help. We still need a lot of donations. Um, and we still need a lot of support. Uh, but that is where we're going. So the, the building we're in now um, is, is an absolute fantastic destination point. Uh, we're excited to expand on that. We're excited to become the National Museum of Aviation and Technology, uh, bring the entire collection all under one roof, 
bring it all back together um, and, uh, and it'll give us the opportunity to expand our STEM programming. It'll give us an opportunity to expand our public programming. Um, it will kind of be the anchor for the future of the museum and uh, um, we, are, we are beyond excited about it. Well, Kevin, I'll tell you what, this is a phenomenal place. I've absolutely loved being here. I want to give you an opportunity to uh, kind of give your big sales pitch, tell people <laughs> the website, tell people how they can learn more, tell people about tickets for the upcoming air show. Sure. And then how about we come back out in the summer and we meet with you again and we talk a little bit about the air show and, and more coming in the fall and, and in 2017. How does that Would sound? love it. Would love it, Jim. It'd be fantastic. Uh, and for those that are interested in either volunteering uh, supporting the museum, getting involved with our educational programming, donating artifacts, uh, yankeeearmuseum.org is the website to go to. You'll find all the contact information you'll need there. Uh, for those interested in coming out for either one of our air shows this year, again, yankeeearmuseum.org have links to those air shows. Buy your tickets early. We give great discounts to folks that are buying their tickets early on in the season. Uh, and, uh, and keep watch on that website and the, and the links to that website for all the latest news on the uh, air shows and the upcoming events for the air, for the museum. Kevin, thanks so much. My sincerest uh, thanks for letting me in this museum. Wonderful tour, I've had a wonderful time. This is really a place to behold. I really think people need to get their butts out here <laughs> and, and really take part in an amazing walk through history and then get here in the summer and really enjoy the air show and a lot of family fun. So thanks so much for Thank having Thank you, me. Jim, appreciate it. Folks, I'm absolutely excited that you watch this and I'm really hoping that you take my words to heart and get on your website, get on your computer, learn all you can about this place, plan a family trip and come on out and support this place. It is a wonderful piece of history. They share history here and it's a wonderful place for families. So please think about coming out in this, uh, this summer or the summer 2017, but ma make this a destination place. I think you'll have a lot of fun. I thank you for watching today and we'll see you next time. Folks, I can't tell you how proud I am to have done this show today, and I really need to recommend that you take the time to visit their website and plan a summer or spring trip out here. It's an absolutely incredible place to visit as a single person or for an entire family, so come on out. As always, I want to remind you, check out our website, cultpop.com. You can rewatch this episode or any episode we've ever done. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.